Thank you, Andy. Thanks also for beefing up my publication output. Thanks very much. Um, so, I feel very grateful and thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you about historical ecology. This thing's on a leash, right? Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, historical ecology and conservation. Um, what is historical ecology? Well, in short, it's really the study of uh, human environment interactions over time. But if you unpack that a little bit more, it's about, inter yeah, about interdisciplinary studies. There's a real focus on the landscape as a uni unit of study as opposed to a region. There's obviously a spatial and a temporal component as well. And it has to do also with human activities on the landscape. So I love this expression, which suggests that historical ecology is really the product of the uh, research into the product of this collision between nature and culture or human activities on the landscape. And that really is how one should focus on uh, historical ecology. Why should we study the past? Why do we care? It's gone. Why do we think it's interesting? Well, at one level, knowing something about the past helps us to understand this thing called the present, and it also helps us to understand a bit more about the future. So in one sense, very generally, one studies the past uh, because a temporal depth about the past generates a greater inference about where we are today and where we might be in the future. That's the overarching sort of uh, reason or aim. But there are sort of lower level reasons as well. So first of all, we can study the past to test theory. Many people have written about how South Africa or anywhere in the world has changed in the past. They've got theories about this. And with the, in the climate change community also, there are many ideas about how the future is likely to change. And we can use uh, some of the tools and techniques that I'm suggesting to uh, test some of this theory. We can also use the past to counter uh, or use a study of the past to counter these shifting baselines. My understanding of Southern Africa is very different to the generation of ecologists from the 1920s and 30s, and it's probably different from many of the young people sitting in this room as well about what South Africa looks like and how it might have changed. And by looking at the past, we can set these historical benchmarks, we can set new objectives for conservation, and we can look at thresholds. So if we go beyond this particular threshold in a population or in a landscape, we need to act as conservationists to uh, manage these populations or landscapes effectively. It can also extend our monitoring and evaluation time frame a bit. Instead of starting today and monitoring going forwards, we can find data and baselines that take us back 100 years or even further. And we can say that it, that is what it once looked like, and we can now move forward uh, to today and into the future as well. And finally, you, I think it's a very effective way of communicating the Anthropocene, especially if we're using photographs. Uh, I think a picture tells a thousand words, and hopefully some of these images will show you the power of uh, environmental history. People are drawn to history in a way or in a way that perhaps a dry graph or a table doesn't quite attract people in the same way. So what are the kind of sources that are used by historical ecologists? Um, they're the standard ones that we know about. There's paleoecology, archaeology, a uh, whole range of different materials are used there, or isotopes, and even tree ring analyses form part of the uh, bag of tools that many historical or paleoecologists might use. The others, such as the, uh, the climate records, uh, from diaries, written diaries, ship's logs, of course, <coughs> and then the formal record, which the Weather Service or ACRU or CSAG uh, institutions throughout the country uh, support and hold these, these records. One can also use oral histories, either one-on-one -on -one interviews with people who have lived on the land for a very long time, or communities who have lived on the land, and there are many tools that have been developed by our social science colleagues to enable us to very effectively understand how the landscape has changed over time. Botanical surveys have been around for decades, uh, and there's quite a lot of work which goes back to resampling uh, many of these old botanical surveys, and herbarium records are also useful. 
One area which as ecologists or conservationists don't make enough use of is really these archival sources, either newspaper reports or the traveler's records or even the official government censuses, which in agriculture they call the blue books. And uh, finally, most of us are probably involved in remote sensing of some form or another, repeat ground photography, aerial photography, and satellite imagery. Now that's a whole wide range of tools that I can't really deal with in one short 30-minute talk, so I'm really going to focus on just a few elements that I work on and that I find useful, and I'm going to focus on these two. So starting with the traveler's record, we're lucky in this country to have uh, a wonderfully rich array of uh, traveler's records, very well-written records of the country. Some of the names are up there from about the uh, 1685, the Simon van der Stel's journey, all the way to Birchall's, which is in the early 1800s. And there's been a lot of work on these uh, journals over the last few years. So we have maps, we have locations, we have many of them available digitally as well, such as this one by Robert Jacob Gordon, his trip to the Orange River in the 1770s. And they're remarkably accurate in their locality descriptions in many cases, and they've been used to reconstruct the historical incidents of uh, mammals, birds, and plants, for example, especially by the late Jack Skeed, and with the uh, group from the Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth, Andre Bosov, the late Andre Bosov and Graham Curley as well. And they've produced these three volumes on the historical incidents of mammals in the Cape, Free State, and the Eastern Cape. And they've been used by conservation agencies to provide permits for stocking of private game reserves and prevent the wrong animals going to the wrong places uh, based on these records. The Jack also produced a number of... Uh, uh, well, he produced a rough text that's been turned into this uh, Strelitzia volume from Sandby called The Historical Plant Incidents of Southern Africa. It's a bit more diffuse, not quite so accurate because there's so many more plants than animals. But you can still use it to differentiate the basics between grasslands and Karoo and some of the species distributions like Acacia Karoo. It's still very useful. But I do think it's an underutilized resource. And I don't think there's been a, enough of a systematic approach to the traveler's record. So this, for example, is Simon van der Stel's 1685 trip to Namaquiland. And if you look at every single entry, you could uh, you know, sort of put it in a table by date and by location and extract some very useful commentary, like um, this one over here, where he notes that hunter-gatherers roam across this country, subsisting on game, of which, surprisingly, very little is found here. And by... There's many other comments as well, such as below uh, the Hufberg, just south of von Reinsdorp. They traveled over a landscape um, covered with grass, which today is only the alien grass, Steeper Capensis and Bromus um, I think Tectorum, which is their indominant. So it's much altered. Or you can get a sense of the kinds of things that um, was happening at the time. While at the Ulufans River, Van der Sel gave permission for the free men, the free burghers, to shoot hippopotami elans and rhinoceros for their needs. So I think a more systematic approach, maybe through some of these uh, social science methodologies that using sort of qualitative or statistical text analysis, I think a lot more work could be done on the traveler's record um, and a lot more could be derived from using them. Another resource that I think we haven't made enough use of is the agricultural census records, the so-called blue books. These contain the census records of livestock and crops for most of the 367 magisterial districts for the period 1836 to 1983, roughly five to ten year intervals. They uh, have they've all been digitized, this data, as part of a project that Sandby ran uh, in the late 90s. But they contain information, for example, on, uh, on sheep and goats and different uh, groups of people who were owning uh, different amounts, and these are the magisterial districts. And once they're all put together in a database, you can convert a sheep or a goat to an equivalent large stock unit, and you can sum all these values for every magisterial district uh, for each of the census years. And you can get a sense of how the stocking rate, for example, has changed over long periods in the country, and in most cases it's declined and there are various interpretations of why this might be so. Uh, 
So it's not without its problems. It's at a magisterial district scale, which is a bit of an odd scale, and those districts all vary in size. They've changed their boundaries, especially before Union in 1910, and then again after 94, of course. Um, what was measured? Sometimes they measured Angora goats, sometimes they measured Boer goats, sometimes wool sheep, not wool sheep. They put them together, and it's all changed over time. Sometimes horses, sometimes not. And the data for the communal areas or the former homelands or TBVC states is very poor. So that remains uh, a, a, you know, a very poor data set. And perhaps the bigger limitation is that after, after 1983, we really have very little accessible agricultural census data. So we don't really know at this level of scale even how the land outside of protected areas is being utilized. But we have used the data quite usefully to help us interpret some of the images that we've taken, for example, in the Macquarland. Here's a graph showing the number of sheep and goats on the y-axis and at the bottom from 1860s all the way through to, uh, I think, the mid-90s where we got data for that. And it shows in the black dots the number of sheep going up and then declining and it's uh, peaking around the 1960s while goats declined from about the 1940s. But there is the same general decline that you see in many of the magisterial districts. And for the cultivated lands, we have uh, four crops, wheat, oats, barley, and rye, with the total hectares cultivated in the red line over the period 1910 to, I think, 1993 or 1983 or something like that. And you see this uh, decline in uh, cultivated areas, a peak around the 1970s and the decline. And we use that to interpret some of our images that we, you, could, you could see in the landscape large-scale abandonment of more marginal areas in the uh, more arid parts of Namakoland. It just was too expensive, the crops are uh, too marginal, and uh, the input costs are too high. And so people have abandoned uh, this large-scale uh, cultivation that happened in Namakoland. And so you see previously cultivated areas from the 1950s, I think this is, and then from John Acox's photograph, and then our picture showing a succession back to some kind of a vegetation. So moving on to aerial photography, I think this is the photograph of the first aircraft to fly commercially in South Africa. Mr. Solomons flew it. And yeah, he's landed on uh, Musenberg uh, Lakeside. And if you look carefully there, you can see my house. Uh, I'm just joking. I don't think it was built then. Um, but uh, he flew uh, uh, not just for commercial purposes, but he also took photographs, not aerial as such, but oblique images. And there's some wonderful photographs, the earliest, I think, from the air taken, certainly of the Cape Peninsula up the west coast and all the way to Port Elizabeth. There's some lovely pictures, like this one, if you can guess, uh, Fishhook. Over here, for those of you who know the Cape, Clavelli, with this mobile dune system, conveyor belt of sand all the way from Fishhook Beach all the way through to Newarthook. And if you go to Google Earth today, you can see it's a wonderful golf course and an urban settlement, uh, and that's progress. But uh, this is what the landscapes looked like. And some of these pictures are very interesting uh, to look at. But there is an official government area, a set of uh, photographs from which government has been taking from the 19, late 1920s, mostly 30s and 40s, all the way through to the present. And if you look at the flight plans, um, you can go into them and you can get uh, any photographs you want for anywhere in the country. Um, and it's provide the... the uh, National Geospatial Information Office in Mowbray, close to the University of Cape Town, provides a very friendly, a very cheap, and a very efficient service for those who are interested in getting uh, historical photographs. So they're very useful and very powerful. And I want to show you um, just how they could be used to reset these benchmarks or reset these baseline uh, uh, sort of ideas that we have about, in this case, Feinbos fire regimes. So this might be the title of a paper an analysis of historical aerial photographs resets the shifting baseline in Feinbos fire regimes. And this is done in the Cedarburg, and it's done by one of our PhD students, Petra Holden, who's looking at a socio-ecological history of the Groot Windhoek wilderness area. And uh, the concern is, of course, in the Cape that based on an analysis of the official fire records, so people have actually gone out and measured fire, which started around the 1970s, that fire frequencies have increased in the biome, and they're likely to increase even further under climate change projections, hotter, uh, um, you know, warmer and uh, less rain, and so we get more frequent fires. 
So this has significant implications for many of the Fanbor species which require fire return intervals longer than five years for enabling the species to flower and set seed. But one has to ask the question, what were the fire regimes like prior to this period of the so-called written record and what are the implications of this information for conservation? So we know from the 1924 symposium on felt burning where people like Rudolf Marloth and Margaret Levins and Neville Pillins and many other early botanists spoke about their frequent incidents of fire, we know that the area was burnt very extensively by early settlers. So here, Rudolf Mahler says, now all this has changed. Hundreds of square miles, so very large areas of luxuriant Feinbos, has been devoured by the flames during a century or two of reckless burning. So we get the, 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 the intimation here that people were burning the felt very um, frequently. And what Petra has done is she's gone back to these 1949 aerial photographs and she's also rectified and spliced or put together something like 170 of these photographs. It's not a trivial undertaking. And she's mapped all the fire scars that will be reflected in the landscape for the past four or five years. And you get a sense from this photograph uh, of the, which she's draped over a Google Earth image, but you're going to get a sense of all these little fires that are occurring throughout that landscape. And uh, what she showed was that uh, fire frequency was a great deal higher and there were these little patch burns. And we know that uh, from the agricultural census record, the livestock record here, from the early 1900s all the way through uh, to the 1980s, that goats were very high. There were a large number of goats grazing in the uplands of the Feinbos biome, on the mountains of the Feinbos biome. Sheep don't like mountains and they hung around the bottomlands and where they have increased over time as have cattle but it's the goat population that has declined so drastically. And if we look today, and we had to, uh, on a Google Earth image, we see a fire scar now, we see a very different way in which the felt's being burnt. We see a single fire burning over a very extensive area, and the area to the left has not been burnt at all. It's a very different way of managing and burning the landscape. And here's a photograph from the 1930s in the Cedarburg, very high elevation. We know that there were many uh, people living often marginal farmers, uh, often disadvantaged farmers. Farmers have been excluded from privately owned land, and they found a living for themselves in these high altitude areas, such as Mr. Fisser here. And he had a, a property where he cultivated, this is at the shale band in the Cedarburg, above 1,000 meters. And he had a plot, he cultivated things, and he burnt the felt for his livestock. That's the most important part. And if you look at that landscape today, of course, nobody's living there. It's now a protected area. But what Petra did was, with all these images that she put together, she then had a, the pink reflects all the fires that were in that landscape, sort of four to five year old fires in that landscape from the 1949 images. By 2014, when she did the same thing, not a single fire had occurred over that period. So fire suppression had occurred in that area and uh, there weren't uh, any fires at all. But by 2014, a runaway fire got started and it burnt the entire area, very hot, very intense, with all the biomass that had built up over those years. It's a very different way uh, in which the species of, 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 of Feinbos have to cope. It's a very different fire regime. So the fire regimes during this colonial period were very different from uh, those which have been in place over the last 50 years. So we have to keep in mind that the baseline has shifted to, if we think that this is the natural regime, perhaps, but it's certainly very different from what it was for several centuries before this. This no-fire policy has its own repercussions uh, with more intense, more widespread uh, felt fires, and it has implications. What we really need is even longer-term studies. Of course, it's never enough. You always want to get more, and we'd like to know from the paleoecologists what happened prior to uh, hunter-gatherers, prior to koi partialists, uh, and what happened during their era as well when they were utilizing these landscapes, which we know they were. So aerial photographs, it has a lot to offer, despite the inconsistencies in the spatial and temporal coverage, um, the relatively small field of view which they have, and you have to work with a very large number of images, pretty low resolution, those that are easily available, different scales, some at as high as one in 20,000, Others, one in 60,000, which are perhaps less useful for a conservationist's needs. And um, 
distortions of the lenses, orthorectification problems, uh, and so on, different times of day. Uh, my advice would be to find yourself a very skilled photogrammetrist, somebody whose business is to deal with aerial photographs and to work with them. They're often looking for good projects, good ideas, uh, and that's what you bring to the table. And they can do the technical stuff and you can come up with the good ideas. Okay, I want to move on to ground photography now uh, as the last part of the talk. And really the kinds of questions that, is interested, that have interested me, or perhaps the main question is, how has the vegetation of Southern Africa changed over the last 100 years for which the photographs are available? And what are the wider lessons? How does this feed into theory and practice? We don't just... We usually don't just use repeat photographs. We usually combine this with as many sources as we can, whether it's traveler's records, aerial photographs, remote sensing. We like field notes. We're comfortable with field notes uh, and, and old botanical surveys. We count populations if we need to. And we're trying to extend the methodologies to incorporate more mathematical, more statistical models in our work. And we team up with some of our colleagues in these departments at the university. And there's been a number of students who've, you know, the, one, the wonderful thing about a university is you have this never-ending stream of, of people keen to learn stuff and uh, very smart. And uh, they have all contributed to our understanding of how South Africa has changed. Many students and many colleagues, especially Rick, uh, my friend who's done a lot of work in Namibia, and Sam, and many others have worked on our repeat photographs. To date, we've taken, we've revisited about 2,000 sites uh, for which we have an old picture. Uh, the coverage is okay uh, south of the orange, but north of the orange, not great. Uh, we haven't spent much time there. Maybe it's our location and our particular bias. But uh, we're strong in, uh, in Namakuland and in maybe KwaZulu-Natal and in Namibia. What I want to do is just take you on a little journey here to show you uh, south and then East to show you what I think has happened to Southern Africa over the last 100 years. So let's start with Namibia. And uh, except for the color, I challenge you to see if there's anything that's really different in this landscape. Uh, very similar, uh, as you can see from this um, first photograph, and then the one taken, uh, what's almost 100 years later. And even if you go to the better watered areas, but still very arid, like near Dubas, uh, in one of the arid savannas, you can still see the same tree present. Uh, it's 130 years older. It's a bit more tired, a bit more... It's, it's due for retirement sometime soon. <laughs> but uh, some of the other things, like this acacia, candelabra, uh, still there as it was. And this is, uh, this is Coates Palgraves, this photograph from 1876. So these are very old images of the landscape. So our sense of what's happening in the more arid parts of the country uh, is that it's very stable, not much change over time. There are some places where it has changed. As you get music, more music, it switches very quickly and you have woody plant encroachment. We have a number of images for Namakwa land, but the story there generally, certainly in the privately owned land, is that it's a very stable landscape. Perhaps, if anything, what we see is a slight increase in cover, better cover, in response to reduction in livestock. We think these rangelands, which were much more heavily grazed in the 1930s and 1940s. Here's John Acox's picture from 1958, the year that I was born. And here's a picture we took in 2005, myself and Rick. So very similar, slightly better cover. In further south now, we're talking about Ladysmith, Montague area in the Little Karoo, south of Toesburg. This is uh, Paul Evans's 1919 picture. And uh, this is our photograph, again, shows very little change in the arid parts of the succulent Karoo. Even these parts over here, if you go, I'll show the other picture. This is these boundaries between Teronia Palins and some of the other succulents, that you, uh, some of the succulents that you see over here on courts. It's very stable, not much change. The only thing that's really happened is that the browse lines have got lower because there's the, the, the fewer livestock. So these earlier pictures... The, veget the trees were much more heavily grazed, big browse lines, and now it's, there isn't much change in the um, numbers of um, species. What has happened is in the riverine areas, there we see an increase in woody plants. We see acacia karoo, even in the Ladysmith area, uh, acacia karoo has come in and uh, really dominating many of these areas. 
What about Feinbos? The fire suppression story is important here as well. This is the pipe track above Camps Bay. Farmers were living here in 1888. They had their livestock close to Cape Town. People were burning. People were chopping wood. People were utilizing this landscape very intensively. And you can see from this landscape here, there are all the rocks that are exposed. Uh, you can see there's a little scree forest here. But what's, uh, what's happened in the meantime is with fire suppression, you see all these forest and forest precursor species are just dominating that landscape. And this is a common story across the Cape Peninsula. Not quite the same across Feinbos. We're not sure yet, but it's something like that. But uh, we have to do more work on it. These pictures are also very powerful for showing what the real impact is in Feinbos also, which is aliens. And here one of our students went and took this photograph, which shows this diverse Feinbos landscape being converted um, to uh, caches, hackia, and pines. Uh, it's not only bad news, though. You can also convey very powerful stories where working for water or local hack, hack groups can also make an impact. Here's from the 1990s. This is not long ago and a local hack group getting involved and transforming this landscape back to something uh, you know, which is more like one would expect from Feinbos. The Nama Karoo in grasslands. Um, we know this is the ACOC story of how the Karoo was expanding supposedly into a, a, an easterly direction and engulfing the grasslands and marching to Pretoria. Here work James Gambiza and Morto Masabilele did. And this is uh, Morto's PhD. And he shows how, in fact, the opposite is the case. Uh, because of the higher rain and lower livestock, we see a shift from more karoo shrubs to more grasses. And there's some very odd things going on as well, like uh, up here near Tarkestat, where we see this uh, karoo sh caroid shrubland over here, and the acacia is confined to the drainage lines. What we see now is a complete conversion to a C3, a Merck's Muller, uh, a grassland, and look how the acacias have just spilled over from that drainage line and are now moving over. Um, finally, I want to talk about um, your area, or this area, KwaZulu-Natal. This is James Puttick, who's done all this work. It's an amazing uh, set of photographs that he's taken. And they show the common story that you're very familiar with. They show places like the Wiener Nature Reserve with an uh, increased... Um, uh, woody plant cover, uh, that's pretty much the story here. And areas near Driok Valley, uh, up I think close to the Drakensberg, and there you see the woody plants really just wanting to get over that lip and take over what's above there. But I think fire is keeping uh, woody plants out. But you see these forests have expanded um, quite a lot since this earlier photograph of uh, Denzel Edwards in 1955. You see they've expanded a lot. One of the big stories uh, for the eastern part of the country, this is in the Eastern Cape, we see this large-scale abandonment of cultivated areas, uh, such as you see here in the 1950s. And uh, what's happened there, where you've abandoned uh, cultivated areas, you see the acacias, which eventually get converted to woodlands, also coming in. Okay, so causes of this, well, there are many. Uh, that's one of the difficult things about all, these imagery, uh, about all this imagery, it's quite difficult to answer the why question. There are many reasons uh, for why uh, woody plants could encroach. Fire and CO2 are currently probably the most favored explanations. So in summary, uh, the story about, the, uh, about vegetation change in South Africa would be that we have a very stable uh, desert environment. Uh, we have a very stable succulent karoo. Um, we have uh, feinbos. Uh, over here, uh, changing because of forest expansion. But really, this story here in the east, this is where it's all happening. I've got two minutes. Um, and we, we see here in... Uh, we're trying to extend our program, not just to have um, us do all the work. We're trying to explore and have more uh, citizen scientists involved. So we launched this thing called Refoto SA, which is a collaboration between us and the Animal Demography Unit. And we're inviting citizen scientists to visit our website where we've put up about 5,000 old pictures. Uh, and each of these pink squares shows that there's at least one uh, historical photograph. And these are some of the people uh, who have added their photographs, including, of course, Ulrich Nanny here from the Drakensberg, uh, 
And uh, I see Ingrid's here. I'm very pleased about that. But uh, these collections are very helpful and useful. A blue square suggests that we have a citizen scientist gone out and already taken a repeat photograph. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to suggest that we can also use these photographs to look at populations, such as the Clan William Cedar. And there have been several reasons for why they have declined. But we can count these individuals uh, using this photograph. So here we had seven were already dead in the 1930s. Ten were alive. And uh, here we have um, only two alive uh, out of the ten. So we can uh, get a sense of what the mortality has been like over time. And we can model these things based on uh, various parameters that we can get from the photographs. And the final story is about cycads. Uh, this is a tragedy. Uh, we have 170 repeat photographs taken at two time intervals, such as here in 1946, 1995 by John Donaldson and Devet Bosenberg. And overall, we had a 78% survive to 1995, but in the period from 95 to 2014, the work of De Sala Kuba Michael shows that uh, we lost uh, only 16% of them survived. And why? Largely, it's removal. And it doesn't matter whether it's a conservation area or a private farm. Removal, in this case, is the major reason for why we're losing the cycads in the photographs. And the communal area is perhaps more to do with traditional, med uh, uh, traditional medicine collection. So why study the past? I've hopefully covered some of these areas. And I'd like to invite you to the time machine. Thank you. <laughs>